cyberspace, there is one place you can go, and you found it. Welcome to the Nightwise.com podcast, the one and only podcast with hacks, tips, and tweaks for cross-platform geeks. My name's Nightwise, and for the coming episode, I'll be your show, your host on this episode of the Nightwise.com podcast called Merging Your Operating Systems, well, for a lack of a better name. Uh, we are recording this episode on Facebook uh, in a live stream, uh, so you can follow along there as well. And if not, you can just download the podcast from our website. Just go over to www.nightwise.com. That's K-N-I-G-H-T-W-I-S-E.com, where you will find the links to everything we talk about and the nightwise.com media feed. Subscribe to that feed and get all of the nightwise.com podcast episodes delivered to your podcatcher automatically. Hey guys and girls, welcome to another episode of the nightwise.com podcast where today we are kind of doing something really experimental, but hey, that's what the nightwise.com podcast is all about. We love our experimental stuff. Today we are um, live streaming this episode on Facebook using cross-platform technology uh, and, and pretty spiffy, good, nice working technology to be to be really honest, and uh, there's a lot going on for me. I kind of have to keep track of everything and make sure that everything works and, you know, <laughs> that this thing actually, you know, uh, gets somewhere. But if um, Facebook melts down and everything crashes and all hope is lost, we still have the audio stream and the people who are subscribed to the podcast will at least still get the podcast. But that is not what we're going to talk about today. Today, I wanted to talk to you guys about the next iteration in cross-platform sliding. Now, for those of you who are kind of new to the podcast, the Nightwise.com podcast has been around for, I got it, last 15 years or something? 15 years. Uh, so we've been around for about 15 years uh, doing all of this, and my big mission starting out was always very, very simple. I want to let technology work for me instead of the other way around, and I want to have any kind of technology work for me. That means Mac, Windows, Linux, iOS, Android, I don't give a crapper. It just needs to work. And I would love to have those things work together. So my mission for the last couple of years has been um, basically finding ways to make that happen, finding ways to let that technology work for me and being able to do stuff across operating systems. I even invented a word for it. It's called sliding. Basically, if you're a cross-platform slider, you just slide from one operating system to the other with your information, your workflows, your applications, or whatever you want to do with you, whatever OS you're using, regardless. Now, a lot has changed in all of those years. Um, um, you know, with, with the advent of the cloud, operating systems have become more and more of, I don't know, an irrelevant factor. I think that the browser is an operating system in itself with the cloud, regardless of what hardware or what operating system that, that you're using. So the importance of the operating system has, has gotten quite a big bump there. But um, on the other hand, we have seen the advent of the ecosystems, the, the, the platforms, you know, like iOS and Android and, and Mac for, for the, the software stores like in Mac, in, 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 on the Mac, in, in Windows. Well, if you can call the Windows software store a store. Oh, not really, but hey. Um, the Linux store. Th there are these closed platforms which still mean that some applications are tied to some platforms, to some operating systems. So being cross-platform kind of still remains important. What I've seen over the last couple of years is that the boundaries between operating systems are starting to fall down. I mean, more and more services and applications are cross-platform, are available anywhere. Uh, they're available in the cloud. Or operating systems are kind of opening up those boundaries in order for them to still get new users towards them, except Apple. Apple is locking everything down. But, you know, but there is a change. Uh, the last couple of years, and, and that was also one of the reasons why the inspiration for the podcast wasn't always really um, forthcoming, sliding has become, I don't know, more relevant. I, I it, It's... It, 
it doesn't really matter anymore which operating system I am using. Apparently, I can kind of do almost everything almost everywhere. If I take a look at my, my workflows today, there are very, very few challenges that lock me into a certain operating system. So that's, you know, that's kind of a good thing. I mean, for, for us as users, that means that there's more choice, that there's more out there to do. So that's, that's a good thing. But, um, you know, it, it, it changed the technical challenges uh, and it also changed my workflow. Now, my workflow is, um, I'm, I'm a, aside from being, a, an, I don't know, an internet rock star, uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm also a freelance consultant and I uh, run my own business where together with my wife, I help companies, small companies, to let technology work for them instead of the other way around. So that means that I am out and about a lot and that I, as a consultant, am mostly working on foreign networks, that I'm working on somebody else's network, somebody else's infrastructure, somebody else's systems, or even somebody else's computers. So what I call a, I wouldn't call it hostile, but I would call it an alien environment, basically where I'm always outside of my own personal digital ecosphere. Now, I do carry my uh, own digital ecosphere with me, of course, because um, as a consultant, I work for a large company a couple of days a week. They have a pretty cool uh, bring your own device policy, like most of them do. I mean, these days, they, they you know basically say, you know, here's Citrix, connect, do whatever you want. And we don't care anymore if it's a Mac or if it's a PC or even if it's a Linux machine, you know, as long as you can connect to Citrix or you can connect to our cloud environment, you know, whatever, it works. Here's a guest network, do your thing. So I get to, you know, I, I've, I have the luxury of, of being able to, to um, carry around my own very own little um, computer every day. And of course, I have more than one computer. So here I am, I have kind of weighed down the, 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 the whole infrastructure part that I have to a couple of computers, and basically I have what I call the big three. And the big three are uh, my Lenovo X1, which is a, um, which is, a, what is it? It's a Windows uh, i7, it's a Windows computer, i7, 16 gigs. Um, and it's a really, really nice machine. So Lenovo, it has a keyboard that you would marry if you were a bachelor. It has a fantastic battery life. It has all the muscle power it can because it's basically really actually hosting uh, this uh, live stream, you know, and doing everything at the same time. And it's a great machine. I absolutely love it. And it's my business machine. You know, it, it runs all of my Windows apps and I like it. On the other hand, I have my um, Mac. It's a MacBook Pro. It's a 13-inch i5, 16 gigabytes uh, of RAM, a 512 SSD, just like the IBM. And these are kind of like, you know, sister ships, you know, the, the USS Enterprise and the USS Yorktown or, or what have you, you know, kind of like two cousins on, on both sides of the spectrum. Two powerful machines. Why on the business, uh, on the Lenovo, I do most of the business related stuff. It's mostly creative stuff and my presentations when I go out as a public speaker on the Mac. So these systems are side by side and I've gotten my workflow uh, really tuned to the point that basically I can snatch up either uh, or, or, you know, either machine in the morning and go out the door and I have everything that I need to have. So I'm, I'm really, really happy with that. That's, that's cool. And then I have um, a desktop-ish machine that runs uh, Linux and also have a Linux server downstairs. You know, I talked about that in the uh, Diet Pie episode. And I, I have a Linux desktop. And what I meant, what I started to notice was that that Linux desktop wasn't getting any love, really. You know, I just because I kind of didn't need it. Uh, a, I have a busy life. <laughs> if you're a, if you have your own company, you, you kind of know what to do in, in the evenings. Um, but also when I wanted to geek out, I went like, do I really need Linux here? I mean, I, I've got a Raspberry Pi I can connect to. I've got a Linux server I can connect to. Um, I've got the Mac here with a, with a terminal. I've got Windows with a terminal. Do I actually need um, a Linux desktop. 
And because of that, you know, there was no, there is no Linux desktop that I can snatch up and take with me, you know, or I'll have to configure a laptop and, and, and put that ready. But, you know, just having another laptop to have another laptop. Yeah, it would be nice to have the big three, but, you know, one of the three isn't going to get any love. And, you know, and that's one of the reasons I sold one of my uh, machines a couple of months ago, the XPS 13, because it just wasn't getting enough love. So um, one of the other philosophies, aside from from letting technology work for you in, instead of the other way around, was also um, finding a way to simplify my life. Because, you know, having three systems means that you have three systems to maintain and, and, you know, you have to have them charged and it's like, is that laptop charged or not? Or God knows what. And I thought it was becoming quite inconvenient. And I went like, hmm, you know, three systems and a tablet and a phone. And, and at, at some point, although I love my geekery, I am really, really starting to simplify my life and, and decrease the number of, of machines that I want and that I need to maintain. And I was inspired by um, by this great episode, uh, no, sorry, great audiobook called Pirate Cinema uh, by Cory Doctorow. And um, it's a it's a it's a free book actually. You can you can download the audiobook and there's this great British guy who who made an audiobook out of it just so you know one of one of the readers decided to turn it into an audiobook. And I read this book um, or listened to this book a couple of months ago or two years ago, I guess. Um, and it was so charming because this guy, it's about somebody who get, gets kicked out of, uh, of his house and he becomes homeless and he still wants to be creative and he doesn't have a lot of, of means. So, you know, he, he, he um, you know, he finds his way around and he has his laptop, his one machine, his lappy, and he calls it his lappy and he has it with him everywhere and everything he does is on his lappy and his laptop has, he has this intimate relation with it, with this device, which is like the, 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 the core of his digital existence, the, 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 the basic of his, of his creativity. And I went like, wow, I mean, I'm, I was kind of envious of that. It's a first world problem if you have multiple machines and you can't choose what you want to play with, you know, I know. So I was actually kind of envious of the simplicity of just having one machine. So I thought one machine, that is maybe a little bit too far, taking it a little bit too far, but let's take it from three physical machines to two physical machines. So the Linux desktop got decommissioned. Oh, shocker. <laughs> Don't worry. I have found a way to bring Linux with me wherever I want to go and completely integrate it into um, my workflow and my machines, simplifying my hardware and increasing my productivity. And how I'm going to do that? Well, that's uh, something I'm going to tell you right away. Let's get into the meat of the matter. Nine out of ten Jawas listen to the Nightwise.com podcast. <laughs> We're going from three to two computers. We have still three OSs to go, so what to do? We still need to take our Linux operating system that we love so dearly, and we still want to take it with us. What are the alternatives? Well, there are a couple of them. Um, one of them is dual booting. Uh, hard drives these days are pretty big uh, and, you know, splitting them up into two halves and switching between uh, to two operating systems, uh, whichever you want to install, like Windows and Linux on your PC and Mac OS and Linux on your Mac, is something that works. God knows I have done a lot of that. And it's nice. It's fast. And it's actually quite cumbersome because when you're in one OS and you want to go to the other OS, well, you need to power down your PC. And it's also kind of tricky because if you mess up the dual, bu dual boot configuration, you might accidentally wipe part of your hard drive or you might wipe your boot sector and be uh, stuck with two 
perfectly intact operating systems in two different parts of your hard drive and no way to access them whatsoever. Um, I've had the beautiful uh, experience with Windows where you set up a dual boot and it looks fine and you go like, yeah, I've got two, C two PCs and then Windows does an update and your boot sector is gone and you cannot launch your Linux machine anymore. And the same goes for OS X, who is making it even harder to dual boot these days. So not really an option, but there are alternatives. And of course, virtualization is one of them. Now, before I looked for a good solution, I really started thinking about this and I went like, mm, do we still have bare metal PCs and, um, you know, s operating systems on top of that? Is is it still like that? Do we still need to look at a computer that way? That it's, it's hardware with an operating system and applications and data and, and or is it differently? Well, I thought about it. Uh, sorry, bumping the mic here. I thought about it for a while and I've come up with this little alternative where I say that basically, um, for me, a computer consists out of, I know, a couple of layers, you know, there is, of course, the hardware layer, but these days it's mostly all i386. It's more, it's it's all Intel or AMD i386 architecture. It's not like there used to be uh, G4 uh, Max and and Intel PCs or stuff like that. So it's it's kind of all the same architecture aside from the ARM architecture that is currently you know on the rise, but we're not there yet. So you have the hardware architecture and on top of that is the OS layer. To me the operating system is just a layer on top of the hardware that you use to interact with the machine. On top of that is the collection of applications of uh, said OS which is my application layer. These are all the programs that I use to get things done. Um, on top of that I have what I call my uh, data layer, which is the information that I use. Then I have the connection layer, which is the connections that are used to go towards whatever that can be a connection to a local network, connections to the cloud, connections to the internet, connections to a VPN. This is all, you know, these are different connections going out or into your PC. And then on top of that, once you are connected, you've got the what I call the cloud layer, which is the collection of cloud-based services. Now, most cloud-based, uh, the cloud-based layer is sometimes perfectly OS uh, agnostic. You know, it doesn't care. If you come with a browser and you have an internet connection, it will do its thing. There are, there are, I don't, I don't know if there are any websites out there that still use Flash or DirectX or, or anything that is OS specific. Hardly. Uh, luckily, it's all, uh, you know, cross-platform. But the other layers, like the connect, the connection layer uh, and the application layer, are not always that OS agnostic. And your data is, you know, tied to your OS, is it not? So I've started to look at this and I went like, okay, where can I play around with um, tools that are available, with applications that are available to make sure that I can not only cross-platform slide from one device or one platform to the other, but to actually start merging these platforms together. So that's what I started to work on. And I've come up with a couple of ideas and I'm going to tell you about one of them today that works both on Windows and on the Mac. And next time I'll tell you about a second one. The great thing with computers these days is that they are pretty darn fast. I mean, um, if you go to the store, buying an i7 is pretty darn easy. So there's not a lot that you have to do. Uh, it's not really expensive. There's not really some a lot to worry about. It basically just works. And, you know, buying an i3 or buying a, a low-end processor is... Well, you, you kind of have to make an effort. These days, there are decent processors out there for a good price. Good. CPU power is cheap. Memory is cheap too. You, might, you get 8 gigs or 16 gigs for, for, I don't know, for free. Oh, well, almost for free. Most laptops these days come with uh, 16 or minimum 8 
uh, mostly 16 gigabytes of RAM, which is, you know, an enormous amount. An i7 processor with 16 gigs of RAM, that used to be, that used to be a server back in the days. This is now your average laptop. And disk space has also become smaller than it used to be, but still quite cheap. I mean, a terabyte SSD is still pretty pricey, but 512 gigs, dirt cheap. And, and it's fast. So even if you buy kind of a mid-range laptop, you still get a decent machine. Machine, And if you buy a high-end laptop, like, you know, the 16 gigers uh, i7s that I have here, an i7 and an i5, these are fast. And basically what they're doing the whole day long while you're, I don't know, surfing Facebook, uh, browsing Reddit uh, or, or, or chatting on Discord is nothing. They are absolutely bored out of their skull because a lot of the CPU power these days is hardly used at all. I'm not saying that the memory isn't used because quite frankly, if you use Chrome, it will eat every stick of memory that you have, your neighbors and then some. So aside from that, you know, a power hungry Chrome, there's not much for your computer to do. You know, it doesn't really have to do an effort anymore to to run the operating system. You know, I, I've got some old machines uh, in my in my den, which are like Windows 95 machines. Um, and um, I want to boot them up and, and, you know, restore them. My God, these things are like moaning and huffing and puffing just to run the bloody OS. And these days for your average laptop, it's like meh. The OS, whatever, you know, just, you know, give me some Chrome to have my memory actually do something. So these things don't do anything. So what do you do with them? Well, I thought, why just let them run one OS? Why not let them run two operating systems? So we have our physical layer, our hardware, and then we have our operating system. So why not two? Yeah, sure. Dual boot night wise. No, two at the same time. Your computer doesn't have anything to do. It has plenty of RAM to go around. Why not take two operating systems with me at the same time and run them at the same time? Getting some text messages here uh, to distract me, which is really annoying. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so that's what I thought about. And I thought like, okay, the best way to do that is, of course, virtualization, where you basically run one OS inside the other OS. And virtualization has been around since the dinosaurs, uh, or a little bit later. Um, but hey, it's cool. But what you end up with is a virtual machine, which is basically a computer inside your computer, completely locked down. Um, with its own OS and its own file structure and its own little bubble. And I thought, like, that's nice because, you know, one of the great things of an operating system, of a virtualized operating system, is that it is completely separate from your other operating system. And I went, like, I don't want that. <laughs> I actually don't want that. I want them to work together. So I kind of sniffed around. Um, the software that I chose to virtualize um, my Linux um, operating systems alongside my, my OS X and uh, so Mac OS, I keep saying OS X, it's Mac OS and Windows operating systems is VirtualBox. Now there are plenty of others out there. You can run Parallels on the Mac. You can run VMware on the Mac. You can run, uh, um, I don't know, yeah, VMware on, 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 uh, on Windows. And you can even, and I think it's Hyper-V, I have to check. Uh, there's this native virtualization layer on Windows that you can actually use that kind of uses a, I don't know, a, kind of a side room of your processor to get things done. And that kind of works as well. But I went with VirtualBox because it's cross-platform. And for me, it's important because if we will be using another operating system alongside our Windows machine, uh, our, our Windows OS or our Mac OS, I also want to be able to kind of port that virtual machine, that operating system across the different hardware platforms. And for that, I need a cross-platform virtualization application, hence VirtualBox. It's also free. Version 6 has just hit the market. I am pretty darn pleased with it. It's, it's really cool stuff. So um, what you do is you install virtual stuff, virtual stuff, virtual box. <laughs> 
So I've got VirtualBox installed. I am pretty pleased with it. And then I start to uh, kind of, you know, set up my VM. So the first thing that you do when you want to integrate, oh, I really have to make sure that I know where I put my iPad down. Sorry about the bumping, guys. Oops, I'm going to do it again. Um, the first thing you want to do when you kind of want to host that extra OS alongside your what we call native OS or your host OS um, is to make sure that you pick a good distro. Now, there are a lot of Linux distros out there, more than you can shake a stick at. Uh, there are the exotic ones out there. There are Satan Linux out there, even if you want to. I, I think these guys are still around. There's 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 Christian Linux out there. There's hacking Linux out there. There's Chinese Linux out there. You mean you name it? There's a Linux distro out there. There are too many darn distros. But that's a discussion for another day. Uh, I'll talk about that next time. What I do want to say is that pick one that is well supported. It's nice that you will find this little niche, little Linux distro somewhere in the corner that is really, really cute. Don't. Take something that's mainstream. Take an Ubuntu, um, to say if you're adventurous, take a Red, uh, Red Hat. Is it called Red Hat? No, it's not even called Red Hat. I forgot the name. Um, I never use a Red Hat distro. Sorry, Debian guy. Um, you know, take something that is mainstream. Um, for example, an Ubuntu distro, a Debian distro, something like that. Something that is well supported, that is way up top in the... Um, in the list of, of most downloaded applications on uh, on DistroWatch, and you'll be fine. Why? Because, you know, they kind of are well supported with the virtualization applications. And in this case, with VirtualBox, that's important because you have a seamless experience between your um, host system and your guest uh, virtual machine. We need those uh those uh, guest virtual machines to be well supported. So choose your distro and choose it wisely. Download the ISO, fire up VirtualBox, create a new virtual machine. Here it goes. The first thing uh, when you set up a new virtual machine is that you can configure it. Okay, go through the different screens in VirtualBox and the first thing that you want to give it is memory. Now you're going to play nice. You're going to expect that this second operating system that you're bringing with you um, kind of is going to be performant. You know, back in the days, we used to have different virtual machines for everything, and we would give them one gig of RAM just to play around, and we'd boot them up and fiddle around in them and then ditch them again. This is not going to be the case here. You are going to give this uh, virtual machine 50% of your computer. It's like, you know, Jeff Bezos's divorce. Hmm? Here we go, 50%. 50% of your RAM, if you have 16 gigs of RAM, 8 gigs of RAM goes to the virtual machine. That's a lot. But, you know, you want to play this 50-50 and have a good experience. Up next, you can set the display memory and the it's a video memory. This is an important one. By default, VirtualBox kind of doesn't really give um, your, um, your virtual machine a lot of uh, video memory. So I just max that out to 128 gigs. Oh, sorry, mags, mags, megabytes. Uh, I max them out um, all the way, and then I just say, you know, boom, you get the maximum amount of video memory, and you enable 3D acceleration. Very important in the video settings. Now, you can also assign multiple CPUs to your uh, virtual machine. Now, for me personally, I've never tweaked with this setting, so I'm not going to do that. But what I did, um, what I did give it was uh, as little extras as there were. You know, you know VirtualBox has this ability to, you know, bridge serial ports and 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 uh, give it a virtual floppy drive and a virtual CD-ROM drive, and you know, I kind of take that all out. So my virtual machines are basically a hard drive, and that's it. And I just use the floppy or the floppy CD-ROM virtual CD-ROM once to to upload the image. So the next up, uh, the next thing you're going to give it is storage. And this is where it gets interesting. Back in the day, if you wanted to have a virtual machine with all of your data, uh, you know, playing side by side with your, your native uh, OS, well, you needed to give it space, you know, because all of the data was inside the virtual machine. And that was handy because it was a completely sealed bubble. But that also mean that you needed to give it quite a bit of disk space. Don't. 
give it 64 gigabytes. That's what a, an, an average OS kind of needs, and it's enough because we're going to do a little fancy trick to um, kind of merge the data layer on top of the operating system layer underneath the virtualization layer. I'll explain. So just give it uh, 64 gigabytes, you'll be fine. So max out the video, give it 3D acceleration, and you can then choose uh, how you want to set up the um, network interfaces. You can either set it bridged, which means that it will, the virtual machine will connect directly to the network where your computer is connected to, or it will be a NAT interface, which will mean that it will be behind your um your um, physical machine. So basically, and just like behind it, it could be behind a router. It's like a, behind a virtual router. Depends on what you want. I mostly let the computer NAT the connection because uh, that way the virtual machine uses whatever physical connection to the internet, that be Wi-Fi or 3G or wired, the host system uses. You, if you put it bridged, you can actually assign it to one of the uh, interfaces, like the virtual machine is on the wireless, and the other one is on the wired, and it's it gets complicated. For me, I just nat it, because then you don't have any issues if you switch uh, network interfaces like wired, wireless, 3G. Your virtual machine will just say like, okay, that's fine, whatever connects, I'm 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 game, I'm with you. Um, and then it's uh, time to install it. Basically, just go through the installer, install your operating system, be happy and be merry, have a have a, have a drink, uh, and and be quick about it because it's not gonna um, it's not gonna take long these days. I mean, you got an OS installed in what ten minutes, and um, once you're done, do the update. So update your um, Linux operating system. You know, if it's a Debian, do the, the sudo apt get update, sudo apt get upgrade, and uh, install the restricted extras and, and all of the doodads that you would like to install. You know, all the software that you like to have. Now, there's a big chance that um, the virtual machine will be in a window, and when you maximize that window, it will stay in a very small uh, resolution, which is, you know, <laughs> not really convenient. So you need to install the restricted extras. Now, VirtualBox lets you install a virtual CD onto your, you know, it, it, it kind of slides a virtual CD into your Linux distro and that will auto run. And this will automatically download uh, or install the restricted extras. And these give a couple of functionalities to your virtual machine that kind of enhance its use. These are pretty important because we're going to use two very important ones of them. So make sure that you install those restricted extras. Sometimes the auto boot, you know, the auto boot of that virtual CD won't work. Don't panic. Mostly, and I'm speaking for Debian here, the uh, restricted extras are standard in the uh, Linux repository. Sometimes the ones that come with VirtualBox, if you downloaded it from their website, are newer than the ones in the repository. But if you can't get the CD started, you can install them by just going uh, sudo apt install VirtualBox virtualbox guest dash and then just hit tab a couple of times and you see the um, different packages that you can install. Just install them, not a problem. After that, do your upgrades, reboot your virtual machine. And if all goes well and you maximize the virtual machine, you will see that whoopa, the resolution will grow alongside with it, which is which is really, you know, which is handy because uh, then you can at least use the um, then you can at least use the maximum resolution of your screen and you will actually, you know, get a full screen virtual machine. Full screen virtual machine, that's good. Uh, audio is probably working right now. Um, blah, the network connection is probably working right now. That's great. You've got so your applications installed. That's fine. Now's the trick. You can mount a folder on your local hard drive of your host machine into your guest machine. And this is pretty darn cool because um, what I really liked about this is that I didn't have to, you know, 
think about, oh my God, how am I going to get all my files into my virtual machine? You know, I've got this Linux virtual machine and it's nice and there's no data in it because you don't have to sync it via the cloud and I have to double my storage on my hard drive. No, just mount your local home directory from your Windows or your Mac system into a folder inside your virtual machine and connect them directly. Now, to do that, um, you use an option that uh, mount, that's called Mount Shared Folders. You will be browse, you will choose a transient folder, which uh, there's two kind of folders, and I've noticed that the transient folder one works the best. So you click on Mount Shared Folder. Uh, you browse to uh, the home folder of your host system, your Windows machine or the home folder uh, on your Mac. And you assign a local folder inside the virtual machine. So you might want to make that folder called, I don't know, slash mount slash, I don't know, home, uh, whatever. Make sure that you still remember it. Create the folder in the virtual machine. Mount the home directory to that folder and make it a permanent mount. Now you will see that this folder gets mounted automatically at startup, which is cool, but there might be an issue that from your virtual machine, from your Linux machine, you don't have access and you need to get yourself into the same group as the virtual host. And I'll put a link in the show notes on how to do that exactly. Um, but this was a little workaround that I, I, I needed to, to fumble around with, but I did manage to get it working though. So, uh, once that was done, um, it, it, it really started to get interesting because what you have right now is, get with me, you have your physical layer and on top of your physical layer, you have your operating system layer and you have two operating systems. You have Linux left, Windows or Mac on the right. Each of these operating systems has its own applications. Fine, two basically different OSs, but these um, operating systems with different applications share the same connection to the internet. And here's the kicker, they have the same data set that they use. So you have a real time synchronization. Well, it's not a synchronization, it's an actual access to files and folders on your hard drive, whether it is from your host system or your guest system. So you can pounce on those Word files and those text files from two different computers as if they were a shared network drive. But it's not a network drive, it's local. You can even do this stuff offline. You don't need another machine, you don't need anything else. So that is actually, um, well, that's that's the fun stuff. That That's where it's it gets interesting. It's geeky, but bear with me because now I'm going to talk about how I use all of this. Hence, the great, wonderful fact that uh, Linux comes up with the most brilliant things for years and years and years, like virtual desktops. And thank the matrix, um, both OS X and Windows have also taken on virtual desktops. And this is where it gets interesting. How about you put your virtual machine full screen on virtual desktop number two? or on Mac, just put it full screen. Good, no problem. The only thing you need to do to slide from one operating system to the next is basically swipe on your touchpad. Because, you know, you can swipe between desktops or full screen applications, both on your Windows touchpad and on your um, Apple touchpad, you know, with a couple of fingers. So it's like da 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 doing something in Windows or OS X, and then like, where's my Linux machine? Whoosh. So no more dual booting, uh, no more dragging two machines around, just swipe to get to the other operating system. And then you're not in an isolated environment. No, 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 no. You are still tied into that shared folder on, on your physical machine. So, you know, stuff still works. So I have found this very interesting to do where I go like, you know, tap, 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 tap. Oh yeah, okay, other, other OS, tap, 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 tap. And because, you know, you, you share the audio and stuff, I've got like, you know, music playing in Clementine on Linux, and then I go to the Windows, and then I've got my Word open or my Citrix session, because which is a third machine to really, you know, <laughs> blow my mind. But 
at a certain um, point, I went like, oh my God, on what operating system is this um, application actually running? And then I thought like, you know what, I don't even care anymore as long as they work. And that's when it gets interesting when you kind of come into this flow and you start merging operating systems together in your head and and sliding from from OS to OS as if it were two different windows and basically jumping around different computers working on the same data set. So that is really, really nice to to work with. And it's 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 cool uh, to use them side by side. It gets even more interesting if you have two screens like me um, I, at home uh, on the left here. I have my uh, big monitor. I have my PC on the other hand, my laptop. So what I mostly do is, you know, windows to the left, full screen, well, not full screen natively, and uh, my Linux VM to the right, full screen, and basically my mouse and my keyboard just, you know, jump in between. I have two computers right in front of me running on the same hardware at the same time, having access to the same layer. Now this is where dual screen really starts to shine. Um, if you're not, uh, if you don't want to swipe around between OSs, you can basically, you know, have them running at the same time, accessing the same data. But I also mentioned the connection layer. And this is where it gets interesting. The connection layer is basically the layer that connects the operating system to whatever. That can be a connection via 3G, that can be a connection via wire, that can be a connection via wireless. So what I have when I work at, uh, when I work with clients, I am in their network. I need to connect to their Citrix server, for example, to, to you know, do the thing. But I also want to connect to my network at home. So if I launch a VPN, well, it's going to tunnel all of my traffic to my home router and I will start VPNing from there. Or if I use something like NordVPN or God knows what, you know, it will traffic, it will, you know, redirect me away from the customer's network where I'm on through a tunnel to the internet to my VPN endpoint, either at home or online. This is the general idea of VPN. Now I can know you can set up split tunnels, but that's kind of making it harder than it is. So what I wanted is I want my native system to be to behave, be connected to the net, the customer's network so it can access the customer's Citrix server and I can run the Citrix session, but my Linux machine will do something differently. That one will set up a VPN from its operating system layer using its connection layer and tunnel home or tunnel to NordVPN, or set up an SSH tunnel to God knows what, basically completely isolating its traffic from the rest of uh, the traffic originating from my computer, basically merging, you know, two operating systems on one piece of hardware, accessing the same data, having different applications, and being connected to the net in a different way, either one directly or one via a VPN, whatever works. Now, I know you're going to say, well, Nightwise, the virtual machine is natted. So you could actually, if you tunnel all the traffic of the host machine, the traffic from the virtual machine will get natted as well, will get VPN as well, will get tunneled as well. Yes, I know. But what if I don't want that? What if I want to, you know, uh, do it differently? It's, it's kind of nice um, to play around with that because your regular PC is just, you know, doing some doing this regular traffic it's like okay it's, it's behaving whatever it's doing whatever all the other computers on the network are but my virtual machine is you know sneaking about you know telling away and going like yeah you know just look at the other guy look at the host system i'm the uh, guest system and i will tunnel my way out to whatever connection that i want to make so there are pretty cool ways of of um, letting these operating uh, systems play together. For me, um, one of the things that I've really, really started to enjoy is having the flexibility of uh, some Linux commands, uh, especially bash commands, um, that really do its thing in Linux that really make it shine. But now I have access to the files either on my 
uh, Max hard drive or on my Windows home directory. And, and you know, I can unleash the power of, of bash scripts and Linux commands onto the native uh, files on my hard drive, which is really convenient. There are some killer apps that are only available in Linux uh, that don't run on the Mac, that don't run on Windows. Well, I, I, I'm using them. I, I can let them run at the same time as my other um, um, as my other systems. I can, you know, at least uh, ob- I can obscure everything. I, I can obscure my entire network traffic by using a VPN on the host machine or just a part of it by using a VPN on the guest machine. And of course, my entire setup in my virtual machine is portable because it's software. I can make snapshots every time that I'm working on it or once we, uh, you know, uh, install something on it or experiment with it. You know, there's still, you know, that ease of use, but you have to be careful. You are linked to your root machine to your physical machine so if you i don't know get in a nasty virus or run a a, 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 an evil bash script that wipes your drive well you know your virtual machine will have access to your home directory so be very very careful with that you know you're playing with 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 live here you know this is not the experimental virtual machine that you use to lick the digital toilet seat of the pirate bay um, no, no, this is, this is, you know, the real deal, having access to your live data. And that's something that you should really, you know, bear in mind. It has some added advantages. I've been hearing people bitching and moaning for months or years now that there's not a decent Google Sync client in Linux. There's not a decent OneDrive client in Linux. There's not a decent what, what have you uh, cloud sync client in Linux. Well, I don't really care. Windows or OS X takes care of the cloud syncing, but I make sure that my Linux virtual machine just has access to the files. And it's so nice. I mean, my virtual machine changes a file on the host machine and the host machine backs it up to the cloud. And when I open up my other machine, um, you know, my other host machine, you know, the files get synced over. So even I don't for for my virtual machines, there is no cloud. It's just, you know, files. And the synchronization is handled by a different operating system. So there is a ton of ways to use this. And I've been playing around with it for a couple of days now and really, really loving having these things side by side. I don't have to let go of my Linux operating system, but I don't have to carry an extra uh, computer with me. And I don't have to go through the trouble of dual booting. Everything just works. Technology works for me. The Nightwise.com podcast. It really whips the llama's ass. And that is all we have time for on this episode of the Nightwise.com podcast, the one and only podcast with hacks, tips, and tweaks for cross platform geeks. I hope you got some interesting tips on using VirtualBox and integrating your operating systems with each other instead of sliding from OS to OS. Why not merge them together? Uh, I will be posting links to the uh, show notes, uh, well, links in the show notes uh, on the nightwise.com webpage because there is the little how to on how to get the right access rights to that shared folder in VirtualBox that you do have to take into account. And I'll also give you the link to the VirtualBox uh, download page, but hey, you can Google, okay, you know, um, and that's that's all we have time for. I enjoyed doing this episode as a live episode. It was a little bit different from you know really leaning in and closing my eyes and going into my Nightwise.com radio voice, but just you know talking to you guys. And there's still some work to be done here in the studio. There's a little bit of echo that I want to get out of the. Um, out of the uh, sounds and and there's some you know stuff with the lights that we have to fundle with but this is you know this is why we do it this is an experiment this is trying something out and that's exactly what we did we let technology work for us hosting all of this 
on uh, just one machine uh, and getting all of that out to you uh, via the wonders of Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook. We'll do a live stream on YouTube next time just to try it out. I hope you enjoyed the episode and uh, I will uh, hope that I will find you in the nightwise.com chat room. You can find it uh, at uh, t.me slash nightwise.com, all one word. That is t.me slash nightwise.com. I hope you enjoyed the episode. We will see you guys and girls in the next iteration of the nightwise.com podcast where we are also going to talk on integrating operating systems and merging them together. Until then, let technology work for you instead of the other way around. See you guys. Bye-bye. You have been listening to the nightwise.com podcast. The show with hacks, tips, and tweaks for cross platform geeks. Send your feedback, questions, or start your own personal flame war by contacting us directly on feedback at nightwise.com. You can support the show by sharing it with your friends or writing us a nice iTunes review at www.nightwise.com forward slash iTunes. If you have some credits to spend, click the PayPal button on the nightwise.com website to help us pay the bills. Just remember, there is real life outside cyberspace. But it's not all that important.